it's it's a it's a real privilege for me to um, to welcome Jenya and Lena to um, to pre present tonight and the next two um, meetings as well. Next week's on Thursday, and the following one is on the Wednesday. Um, real privilege for me to introduce them. So um, Jenya and Lena were leaders of um, the trip I made to the tundra in. 1991. So this year, Jenny and Lena, it's 30 years ago. It's just amazing. And uh, we, we've uh, survived the, uh, the in-between years and we are still doing uh, birds in one way or another. And, um, and I, th I think we can consider ourselves um, survivors. So um, <clears throat> Lena is a uh, geographer. Um, Thank you with Institute of Geography of the Russian Academy of Sciences and Genia, you with the Institute of Evolutionary Ecology. Is that right? No, not anymore. No. For the last 10 years, I'm wearing many hats actually. And that's, yeah, uh, okay. I'm, I can tell later if you want to. Yeah, so so you, you get a chance to explain, um, explain later on. I've not, not really caught up with, uh, with everything. So, um, so I see um, Pavel Tomkovich is also part of the audience. Pavel um, also travels to um, the Far East with um, Junior and Lena on the um, Spoonbill Sandpiper work. And um, so welcome, Pavel. It's great to have you. Pavel's um, claim to fame is that he has in his museum in Moscow a um, sandaling, which I ringed on the beach at uh, Komeki. In, uh, in Cape Town. So across the, uh, the continents, we have a, um, a bird in common. Um, and then I'll send the hand over to you, Lena and Virginia, and ask you to tell us about um, the Spoonbill Sandpiper. Thanks very much. It's great to have you as part of this uh, event. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are going to tell you the story about Spoonbill Sandpiper, one of the most unique uh, birds in the world, breeding in Russia and migrating to uh, China and Southeast Asia. But uh, first, uh, uh, let me introduce ourselves uh, and uh, say thank um, to Les for inviting us here. Um, Yevgeny and um, me both finished uh, Moscow State University, the chair of biogeography, and work in different parts um, of the Russian Arctic uh, for, uh, as Les told, nearly 30 years in the expedition of Russian Academy of Sciences and later uh, in, in the expedition of Birds Russia, who, uh, which was organized by Yevgeny. For many years, we worked together with Pavel Tomkovich uh, our supervisor at the university, and um, uh, he is the most famous Russian uh, weatherologist, uh, how we can say, uh, and he started his research in Arctic um, um, quite, quite before us, and, and uh, together with him, we made um, uh, this book, Atlas of the Invaders in the Russian Arctic, um, which has a distinct information about <laughs> about distribution, breeding distribution of waders, uh, and this is several um, pages, for example, with the maps uh, and some information of um, migration, population structure, um, habitat, um, and many other um, things. Uh, one, um, one year we have... Um, one year we have um, less uh, in our expedition. It was East Timer, 1991, and it was a very remote place. Um, um, uh, we flew by helicopter for three hours from local settlement, and um, uh, it was um, um, a peak of lemming year. So we have many snowy owl breeding at that time and many, many waders. <laughs> And uh, next year or uh, one year after, we have, um, um, we have a pleasure to go to South Africa and uh, we attend um, the conference in um, Langeban Lagoon. We were um, kindly invited by Les. Uh, and uh, uh, so we have a lot of impressions on uh, different um, landscape, beautiful landscapes and uh, uh, birds. Uh, 
and the culture and also politic because it was a year of um, um, President Mandela election. So it was a lot of change in all of South African life and um, everything, everything. Uh, but coming back to Russia, to Russian Arctic. <clears throat> Uh, in the year 2000, we start our work in Chukotka. Um, and since we work in there nearly every year, it is a very interesting and, uh, uh, and rich place uh, in birds, in many birds, uh, uh, seabird colonies, and um, also um, red salmon and gulls, of course, around it. Uh, and many, many mammals, um, uh, usually brown bear, but sometimes uh, polar bear in the northern part of peninsula, Chukotka Peninsula. Uh, a red fox who replaced um, Arctic fox is in many areas, also in the coast. And um, um, local people uh, with their traditional style of life, um, Inuit people in the north uh, who rely on whales and walruses. And, uh, uh, Chukchi people in the south uh, who mostly dealing with the reindeer and um, red salmon. And it's also the area of potential uh, oil drilling and um, many other things. Um, uh, and this is also a motherland of Spundus and Piper. And uh, Spundus and Piper, as I told, it's a very unique bird. Why it is unique? First, um, because of the shape of the bill. Uh, you uh, would not find another way than like uh, this. And um, what is interesting that um, spoonbills and piper chicks also have this uh, shovel bill or spoon bill from the early beginning, not uh, like um, other uh, way the chick. Uh, um, those bills are usually changed when they're growing, but spoonbills and piper has the uh, same uh, spoon bill um, big, just the handle is very short. Uh, Second, um, because this bird is, has very limited distribution. It's an endemic species of the Russian Far East, and it's used to breed in the narrow coastal belt um, from um, North Chukotka uh, to North Kamchatka. But um, now the um, breeding range also decreased, uh, and uh, we can met um, Spundus and Piper only in South Chukotka, not far from Moinapilgina, sometimes in other places, but just single pairs. What happens with spoonbills and piper? Uh, its population number dramatically declined in the uh, last 40 years. Uh, it declined over 90%. And you can see some digits here on the screen. Uh, but the, the, the digits bring the species to the edge of extinction. Uh, and now Spindles and Piper is the fastest decline in bird species in the Russian Red Data Book, and it's a category of critically endangered species and also in the list of 100 most threatened living beings in the planet. What are the reasons of its um, uh, declining? Uh, we assume it is a um, habitat change in the non-breeding grounds, a uh, reclamation of intertidal zone in China and Southeast Asia. Uh, another reason is a hunting or trapping or poisoning of the bird, migratory bird, also in non-breeding grounds. And the third reason can be the limitation um, and uh, limitation incubation and low fledging success in the breeding grounds. Mm -hmm, sorry. Uh, and we are going to, uh, to tell more about this problem in our third part of our lecture because we, but I can show just some example of the picture how the uh, habitat, the wintering and the migratory habitat change in China and Southeast Asia. And this is how uh, bird catching and trapping is also going in, in Myanmar, in China, in Bangladesh, in many other countries. Uh, but it's not a problem only for spoonbills and piper. It is a usual problem for many uh, migratory birds um, uh, in East, East Asia, Australasian flyway. 
uh, spindles and pipa became so named uh, flagship species uh, to attract attention um, to many other birds and their problems and um, to attract attention to the, their conservation. So spindles and pipa play a, we name it panda role among birds. So this will be our presentation plan. Uh, today we will make a mm, short introduction and uh, give you a general information about spoonbills and pipa. Then during the second lecture, uh, we will tell about studying and conservation mm, spoonbills and pipa in the breeding grounds in Chukotka. There are many mm, things are going um, uh, in our expedition. And the third lecture will be about study and conservation spoonbills and pipa and other waders along the flyway and about international cooperation. Uh, and I should say, of course, we are not working alone by our own. We have a very big international team, uh, both in our expedition and um, in wintering uh, areas. So uh, in the lower picture, you can see some people who are working in breeding grounds. And um, uh, on the top uh, photo, you can see a group of people who took part in counting spoonbills and piper and other waders in uh, wintering areas and migration place. And this is just several uh, slides from breeding ground from Chukotka. Uh, as I told, this is a Manapilina settlement. Uh, and now many people can easily pronounce this name. This is a motherland of Spoonbills and Piper in Chukotka, where we have our ecological station, where we start work uh, nearly, for nearly uh, 20 years. And this is a very interesting area with the um, uh, Chukchi people, uh, their settlement, uh, and also many, many bears and breeding spoonbills and piper. And when we start our survey, the nearest nest of spoonbills and piper was in 300 meters from the houses. But now, uh, of course, it's not the same. So the situation changed. And I tell you more about this in our next lecture. So this is how territory looks like from the map. Uh, it's our monitoring plot. And this is a settlement and just a general landscape. And we have a saying in Russia, it's better one time to see than 100 times to hear. So I would love to invite you all to come to Russia and to Chukotka, to our station. But now it's impossible also because of quarantine. Uh, but uh, hopefully it will be possible in, in future. Uh, and uh, today... Uh, mm -hmm. sure. So we'll certainly, um, certainly play the video with sound again when we get, uh, when we get, a, uh, get a gap. So you want to uh, chat and answer, answer the questions? Yes. Um, from um, are there are there any questions? The average. Uh, well, the breeding range is about a thousand kilometers from the north to the south. That's that's correct. But the whole flyway is about maybe um, eight thousand kilometers if you take it from North Chukotka to. Um, to Bay of Bengal. Well, it's not as long as from Taimir to, to South Africa, by the way. It's a shorter one, but still quite a big one. So, uh, I see. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark and Diana, yeah. That's, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> uh, so there's a question about um, um, lake flags. Have you put lake flags on all the birds or just on some of them? Uh, your birds? For Spundel St. Piper, we put uh, flags uh, now on all birds, uh, adults, youngs, and also uh, head started birds. We are doing some. Um, uh, Next, next uh, presentation will speak in more detail about that, but we are taking some eggs from uh, nests, rising them in captivity and releasing the chicks to increase the 
productivity. Productivity. Uh, so they have different color of flags, but they all flagged and they all individual uh, coded. So each each, each flag have individual number. combination. This mm -hmm. is what what Pavel Pavel is doing. Yeah, well, Pavel is doing much more than that. <laughs> uh, yeah. But that's uh, so we finally decided that he is the only the only hand which is putting the flags on on the Pavel and his God no forty five summers in the Arctic have probably flagged more uh, waders in the breeding grounds than, than, any, than anybody else, at least in Russia. So Pavel is doing this job and yeah, they all uh, individually flagged. Uh, the, the pale green color, lime green color is the code for uh, southern Chukotka. So we also do uh, mark some other birds. Uh, yellow flag might be from China. Yellow flag would be from, uh, uh, there are two locations where they put uh, um, yellow flags. It's on migration. That's correct. It's China and Kamchatka. Mm -hmm. Kamchatka is a peninsula in the southern part of the Russian Far East, south of Chukotka. So yellow flags will be from there and they will be also with the individual codes. Mm -hmm. Uh, very old flags, which doesn't have any individual uh, individual code. So if you see a spoonbill sandpiper with a color flag without code, it means this bird has got no 20 years old. And it's very, very unlikely. Mosquitoes. There will be more information about mosquitoes next time. Yes, they are, um, they are a remarkable part of the ecosystem. Well, in the coastal areas of Chukotka, there are not that many mosquitoes. Uh, but there are some. But if you go some 10 kilometers inland, then they have good numbers. So, uh, Virginia and Lena, there's a question from Dave Whitelaw, with whom you stayed when you were in it's South Africa in 1993. Yeah. Um, the question about climate change, impact of climate change on the tundra. Mm -hmm. That's something that you're going to be covering in the next talks. Well, uh, climate change in Tundra is happening, mm, but uh, somehow it happens that uh, this part of Chukotka coast is probably changing the least comparing to the rest of the Bering Sea. Overall, when you look at the circumpolar Arctic map, the Bering Sea area, particularly Alaska, is changing a lot, really a lot, probably one of the, the highest rates of change. And we've recently been to the Alaskan site and we've seen the incredible change in the uh, crowberry habitat there. Uh, but in Chukotka for the moment, it is not happening much. And at least not to extend that the habitat of Spoonbill Sandpiper, the remaining habitat will change uh, significantly. It may happen any time, but we're actually planning to start studying it in much more depth than at the moment, but so far, we saw the other reasons for declines, particularly in the non-breeding grounds, which are very significant. So we are mainly focused on that. Predation pressure is high. So that's the reason why population uh, productivity is low. And this is what we are trying to mitigate with head starting. Again, we'll speak more about that next, next presentation. <clears throat> And Dave, thank you very much for your question. It's so great to to say, be able to say hello to you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks, um, Lena and uh, Virginia. We're looking forward to the next um, next two presentations. It's just an an, an amazing part of the um, of the world. You, um, it, the um, the towns and villages of the Siberian tundra are just awesome. You know, they really are just amazing to um, to see. So it's a real privilege to have uh, been at least in the Tamir part of the tundra. And gosh, I would have loved to have got <laughs> more of it over the years. Thanks, Lenya, Virginia, and uh, Lena. We'll see you again um, next week.